Hi guys, and welcome to this session of, uh, of Astronomy 120. This is the lead start, I think we are in week four. So it's important that we get started, I mean, because uh, we have very important business that is coming. So I really need to share that with you guys. Before I do that, let me make sure that the software I have in here is not disrupting us because I want to go to go also through the, the solar system today, which is units 34 and 35, which are part of the exam that we have coming. Anyway, so what do we have this week, which is a very, very important thing. So let me first of all load the canvas of this class. And let me change the view to student view first to make sure that to see it from your vantage point so that I don't have any gaps or issues with it or anything like that. So let me go back into Zoom, share canvas. Okay, so this is what we have this week. Okay, of course, again, the, the objectives, the objectives, you have the uh, stuff that is due and when it's due. And there are clicks and uh, links that you can click on and should take you to where things are. Okay, there is one thing in here that popped up that we did not have before. And that is actually uh, something that we're going to talk about, namely the review for the midterm. Okay. Again, you have the stuff that is the content. The content for this week is units 34 and 35. And we're going to go through them. And it basically deals with the solar system in general, an introduction of the entire solar system as a whole in terms of its structure, in terms of its general properties, and in terms of also its history, how it came to be. Okay, So those are the two units, really, that we're going to be talking about today. We have a homework assignment also, again, that is due on October 8th, not this weekend, but the weekend after. You have plenty of time. I know some of you are engaged in other activities and other classes and things like that. And some of you, at least one of you guys from probably different class sent me a message saying that he is uh, he's, he's involved with the football team on, on Saturday, they play uh, uh, games and he cannot basically do the assignments. I mean, in general, okay, I don't mean to target anybody specifically. In general, I really give time so that you guys can take of it take care of it whenever it is. So if you're guys busy on a given day because of work or other classes or other things, you really have another opportunity. Like for example, if I can do stuff on Saturday, you can do them on Sunday, this Sunday, October the 2nd, before October the 8th when things are due. So there is plenty of time usually for you guys to do your assignments, okay? So that is one thing. The other thing also we have the review for the midterm. We have a midterm. As that's why I'm log logged in as a student in here that doesn't show up, but the midterm actually is going to be on Wednesday, October 5th. Okay, not this Wednesday, not the day after tomorrow, which is going to be the 28th, not the 28th, it's the Wednesday after. So it's going to be on October uh, 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 5th, because we did not really cover the two topics that I mentioned, units 34 and 35, this review will be available on Wednesday. So the review right now, if I click on it as a student, it will tell me that this quiz, which is a review actually, is going to be available on September 28th, which is this coming Wednesday. So again, you are strongly urged to do the review. So let me stop sharing and talk a little bit about that. Again, how this is how it works. You will have a review for the midterm. You're going to go through it item by item, making sure you understand it. The units that are covered in the review are the same units that are covered in the exam, the midterm. They are uh, the units five and six, seven and eight, uh, nine, 10, 11, 12, and then 34 and 35. Those are the units that are covered in the exam. Uh, and they are the exact items that basically the exact units that are also covered in the actual uh, midterm. So by the end of this week, we should be ready 100% for the uh, actual midterm. You open the midterm and you start it. Regardless of what you score in it, just to encourage you to make sure you do that, you go and prepare for your actual midterm, you're going to get full credit for it. So there is no penalty for doing the actual review. In other words, 
if you don't know something and you're preparing for a big test, you're not going to be penalized for it. As a matter of fact, you're encouraged. You're going to get full credit for it. Okay. The idea is this, that you actually do two things. First of all, the assignment is graded, which means that it is important that you do it too, the review that is. And then also it helps you prepare for the actual midterm to maximize your grade in the actual midterm. Okay. So this is the idea behind the, uh, behind the, uh, behind the, uh, the whole process. That's why it's actually uh, needed to go through these things, okay? Uh, again, uh, I will override the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the grade for the, uh, the review. You're going to be given a grade from Canvas, but don't worry about that. We're going to override it and take your time when we're doing the review. Make sure that you go through all of the concepts, make sure you understand everything. And if there is a question, please let me know so that we can hammer it. The review will end on Tuesday, October 4th, around midnight. Because at that point, basically, we should really be, uh, be focused more on the actual midterm. Again, you're going to be receiving reminders from me. One of them is actually the one that is the fact that it's going to be available. The second one is sometime on the weekend. And another one sometime to, to remind you again that the review is available for you guys. On Wednesday, on October uh, 5th, which is not this Wednesday, the Wednesday after, the actual exam is going to be available in the, in the, in the same day, actually. You will have the entire day to do the, your actual midterm, okay? If you are working during daytime, you can still take care of the midterm at the evening. If you are working in the evening, you can still do it during daytime. If everything else fails, you can do it during the, the allotted time for our class in here that we designated. So somehow you should be able to do it and it's only available for one that day and it's only one attempt. And like the review, which has an unlimited number of attempts, you can take the review as long as you want. The midterm actually will have only one attempt and uh, you need to really make sure that you're ready for it. So the actual allotted time, you need to make sure it's about an hour and a half. That is the time where you should be really focused on your midterm and taking your midterm. The reason why I'm saying that is midterms are extremely important for your overall grade. So you really want to take care of them and prepare them and make sure you maximize your grade. I really hope and wish that everybody gets in, gets 100%, not an A, 100% in this midterm. And there is a way of doing it and it's available for everybody. As a matter of fact, all you have to do is do the review, go through the units, make sure you have a full understanding of everything that is covered in these topics. And then I'm sure you're going to get the maximum grade that you could do if you do all of the steps. Should you have any difficulty, please reach out to me and we should be able to resolve this once, okay? So again, the review will end on October 4th. The exam, the midterm is going to be on October 5th. There will be no live session on October 5th, okay? Because I will be on the computer monitoring and making sure that if there is one who has an issue or something, then we can resolve it and move on so that you guys can do your work and you're not uh, impeded in somehow by some other issues or something like that. We can resolve it right away. So uh, make sure you do your preparation and make sure you're ready for this exam. So this is basically that is of extreme importance. And I really wanted to share that with you guys. In addition to the regular stuff that we have, like homework assignments, and some of you are sitting in my lab classes, your lab classes, nothing is canceled. Everything is on, on track in terms of the other stuff. For example, homework three, which is due October 8th, is actually a day after the, uh, the uh, I mean, not the day, I'm sorry, the Saturday after the midterm. So you do the midterm. Hopefully by then you would have done your, your homework. If you still have problems, you still have actually the next few days to take care of it. The plan is for me to cover units 34 and 35 and also to cover some of the stuff related to the homework, but not today. The, the stuff related to the homework is going to be discussed extensively this coming Wednesday so that we have everything ready for, for that. Next week, actually, we'll be covering units 37 and 38. 
And those are not part of this exam. Those are part of midterm two. So they are not part of it. So this midterm is up to units 35, which is covered in this week, okay? So I hope everybody, I know most of you are not here live and we're watching this recording uh, later on. So hopefully you guys have a full understanding of what's going on in here and you don't have any problems, okay? Let me go back to the objectives of this week so that we have an understanding of what we're going to be talking about today. Share. Again, it's on campus. So these are the concepts we'll be covering this week. Namely, we're going to talk about the solar system in general and its composition, components of the solar system. The biggest component of the solar system by far is the sun. The sun is actually the main component of the solar system. More than 99% of the solar system is sun. Okay, the rest 8% and 1% is, or actually less than 1% is shared by, between the planets, which are really the main component of the sun, especially Jupiter and then Saturn. And then uh, comes Uranus and Neptune, which come far behind this too. And actually, they all come far behind Jupiter by itself, stands out. And then the other three, they come far behind. Then finally, the other planets in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, inner planets. And then you have the dwarf planets. And I mentioned a few of them in here that we're going to be talking about them. Then com another component of the solar system that is imp important for us to understand are the moons, OK? The inner planets really don't have moons, OK? Two of them, they have none, completely no moons whatsoever, Mercury and Venus. Mars has two captured moons, Phoebus and Deimos. And then Earth has one moon. I mean, Earth has a moon. Does, uh, Earth does have a moon. It's, and it's not a small moon. It's a big moon. As a matter of fact, it's the biggest ratio moon to planet than any object in the solar system with the exception of Pluto. Pluto and its moon Charon actually are ha, has the biggest ratio. In other words, the moon Charon is big, relatively speaking, compared to anything else with respect to the size of its host dwarf planet in this situation. It's big. The ratio of the two is kind of big. I mean, it's still smaller than Pluto, but it's big, that ratio. Bigger than the ratio of how big the moon is to the Earth. It's still, the moon's Earth is a lot smaller than the Earth, but this is basically in comparison. For example, take the biggest moon in the solar system or the one in near uh, Jupiter, uh, Ganymede, and compare it to Jupiter and it's a fraction that is completely negligible, but it's much bigger. As a matter of Ganymede, the moon of Jupiter is much bigger than Earth's moon, for example. It's actually bigger than Mercury itself, which is a planet, okay? <laughs> so that you have an idea. So it's big moons for Jupiter. It has four big moons. Two of them are supermassive. I mean, as a matter of fact, Saturn also has a big moon, namely Titan. Titan actually is a big moon, also bigger than Mercury. So you have two moons that are bigger than Mercury okay, in the solar system. And one moon of Jupiter, namely Callisto, is slightly, it's about the same size of Mercury, actually. It's not that big from, from it. So here are three moons. That's why moons are important. Here you have three moons. Either they're the same size or bigger than a planet, Mercury. Okay. They're not too far from Mars either. Okay. And then, so in terms of moons in the solar system, and it's worth remembering at least the first few are in terms of size, of course, you have Ganymede, Titan. Ganymede is from Jupiter, Titan is from Saturn. Then you have Callisto in size. Then you have Io, the moon Io, that is actually from, uh, from Jupiter also. So three out of the four big moons in the solar system are belong to Jupiter. One of them is from Saturn. Then after that comes the Earth's moon. So the Earth's moon is actually a big moon relatively. So it's one of the top five moons in the solar system. And then comes uh, the moon from uh, from uh, Jupiter again, another <laughs> moon from Jupiter, Europa, okay? So four out of the six big moons in the solar system happen to be in Jupiter, but they are big moons, I mean, relatively speaking, okay? Then we have another component of the solar system, namely the asteroids, and then we have comets. So those are basically the stuff that we have in the, uh, 
in the solar system that we have everywhere, okay? Describe the, uh, the typical orbital and uh, rotational motion of each component. And then we're gonna discover Kepler's, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, try to remember Kepler's laws and describe the general properties of these components. They all spin the entire solar system in one direction, but some of them are more tilted than the others. So the tilt in here can become a huge issue in here. And then we're going to talk about the density. Why is the density is important? It's because it tells us about the composition of these objects. So I know we mentioned that before in the past that the Earth is the densest object in the solar system as a single object, big object. I mean, there are probably some of the asteroids that are denser, but those are small objects, okay? Then comes after that Mercury, all the inner planets are denser in general than the outer planets, okay? So that is some, some of the characteristics in here in terms of density because the composition. Some of them are rocky and they have, have, uh, they have a lot of metals in them and others they're mainly gas or basically ice uh, giants. So that is basically the big difference between that. And then we're going to use uh, radiometry to determine basically radioactivity to determine the age of the solar system. That's basically how we learn how this all is the solar system, which is about 4.5 billion years, and uh, use that concept to understand how that is done. And then we're going to talk about the nebula theory and how the solar system came out to be. So this is basically the objectives of this unit so that you guys understand where these things are coming from. And then this is because of how the temperature, the temperature, or at least the, the, the proximity from the sun plays a major role in terms of the composition of different elements and the condensation basically and how uh, materials come together. Obviously at a very high temperature, everything is liquid. And even at higher temperatures, everything is gas. And as the temperature starts to cool down further and further, elements with the, uh, with, uh, the higher, basically, uh, uh, fusion temperatures start to melt, uh, start to melt, uh, start to condense first, and then so on and so forth until you get to the lighter gases that condense the last, basically become liquid at li li later and later temperatures. And uh, how the planets form, okay, is also another key thing in here, and gravity plays a major role in this situation. Basically, you have as objects are moving around. Uh, and due to the force of gravity that attract different components, they start to basically come together. And as they do, they become bigger and bigger. And the process accelerates, okay? The process accelerates. Because bigger masses attract more stuff to them than smaller masses. So initially, yes, you don't have a lot of attraction because you have less mass. But then as the distances start to shrink, the force of gravity starts to become more and more bigger until things fuse. And now you have more mass and objects nearby, so the process accelerates, and that's how the planets form. But when they do in this case, again, remember they form at extremely high temperatures because of losing kinetic energy, or losing potential energy, I'm sorry, to kinetic energy. What I mean by that, if I take this object in here, for example, and drop it, it's going to fall. So when I raise it up, it has a potential energy. How do I know that? Because if I let go of it, it's going to speed up and gain kinetic energy by losing that potential energy. Same thing. Objects in the solar system, when they were far away, they have potential energy. When they get closer, they speed up because they lost that potential energy. And speeding up, gaining faster and faster speeds, that means their kinetic energy has increased and temperature has to do with kinetic energy. So the temperature of these objects increased. So when these planets formed, they must have been super hot. So it's like, for example, you take a liquid and you put in it uh, materials with different densities, the denser materials will fall in and the lighter materials or less dense materials will, will, will rise. And that's what differentiation in here is. So basically, in the case of the Earth, for example, the, the denser material, namely iron and nickel and all of those materials, sunk into the core of this, uh, the Earth, whereas the lighter materials, the less dense materials, I should say, for example, uh, the silicate, which is the combination of silicon and, uh, and uh, oxygen, in this case, uh, rose to the surface. So that's basically what differentiation means in here. 
obviously there is another process that is involved also with the activity on the different planets, at least for the case of the Earth. And we're going to get into this one in more detail down the road is the outgassing processes, namely the fact that we have volcanoes and different uh, activities like earthquakes and things like that. Those, they, 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 they send more gas into the, uh, the, and into the uh, upper layers of the planet and they form uh, uh, atmospheres, at least for the case of the Earth and Venus. For the case of M Mars, for example, and Mercury or even the Moon, they had too small to retain those gases. So yes, there were some lunar activities on these things, but they must have lost them also in the process in the old days. Okay, so this is in a nutshell what we're covering in here. Let me stop sharing and share with you the okay the solar system. I have in here a simulation that okay, show more this there, that hopefully will drive up on through. It's called the Universe Sandbox. Let me close this window. So what I have in here is I have actually the solar system. I'm zooming out in here on the solar system as far as I can get in here. This is basically from a very, very far away distance from the solar system. As a matter of fact, if I can put the sun in here in focus, we are at the sun. Uh, we have more information here. Distance from you. We are at about 500, 480 astronomical units from the sun. Basically, we are 480 times far away from the sun as the Earth is from the sun. That's when I zoomed out. I basically uh, put myself at this distance away from the sun. Okay, this is what hypothetically probably Planet Nine is. <laughs> it's really very far away. So if I start zooming in in here, first of all, those small objects in here, I see Eris, for example. That is one of the dwarf planets, actually. When I click on it, it's going to give me more details on this object in here. Uh, its motion, its uh, how far it is from the sun right now. It's 95 basically astronomical units from the sun, and its speed in kilometers per second, and its orbital period. How long it takes to go once around the sun? This is all its, uh, its orbit. Okay, that's what you see in here. Its orbit, and it's an inclined orbit because it's dwarf planet. Actually, we have a picture of it of how it might look like. I don't think that we have an exact picture of it because it's far away. Then you have Orcus, which is another dwarf planet also. It gives you all the vital units for it. It's a lot closer to the sun. But then you have Maki Maki in here. That's another one. And you have Haumea. So these are part of the solar system, but they are far away. What I want you guys to remember in here is note is their path of all of this thing, Orcus and all of the other objects, they have a core in here. They have their orbits kind of not on the same plane as all of the other planets. That's the bottom line. If I start zooming in, now at some point we're going to get into Neptune. Look at the path of Neptune. Neptune is a planet, and this is the last planet in the solar system. Obviously, you might see in here and you find Pluto. What is Pluto in here in the picture? I don't see it. And here it is. It's not too far from. Uh, it's not too far. Uh, sometimes when you look at an object like this one, you might be thinking, wait a minute, like for example, Pluto, its orbit is inside that of the uh, Neptune. And that is not a cl uh, clearly true. I mean, the path itself is actually inclined with respect to the path of uh, Neptune. But if I zoom into a different position, now you see that actually its path, although it takes it very close from uh, Pluto, from Neptune, but it really is not inside. In other words, there is no collision between these two. Okay, so when you look at it this way, you might thinking, oh, at some point in here, I can see. I mean, I see the, uh, the galaxy in the background in here, but you can be tempted to think that maybe these two paths they, they intersect one another, but it's uh, it's uh, hardly so. Okay. So this is the actual path of the two. So now the point I'm trying to say in here also is that for this planet, as I uh, as I paint through the entire picture, all of the planets they fall into this orbit. Okay, from here, they are all on the same plane. You have Neptune, you have Uranus, you have Saturn, you have the Sun. The others they are actually not visible because they are too too much inside the Sun, basically, including Jupiter, by the way. Okay, too far into the uh, closer to the sun. So the only thing that is visible in here is the sun. 
And that is what we call the ecliptic plane. You have to remember this point in here when we go study the, uh, the, the formation of the solar system, why all of the big objects, including the sun and all of the planets and their moons actually are on the same plane. Whereas these objects in here, like Pluto, for example, Quawar, Maki Maki, they are not on the same plane, they're on a different plane. Now, if I zoom out, I mean, if I paint out, now Jupiter all of a sudden it's visible, but it's well within the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, well inside this whole picture. I mean, in this point in here, I don't see Earth, I don't see the Mars, I don't see any of these things. I really have to zoom closer to see those objects in here. Okay. Now we're talking about the structure. Now we can see more and more objects into the uh, solar, uh, solar system. So this is at this point in here, distance. We're look, still looking at the planet in here. No, I don't want to go back into uh, Omiya. Sorry about that. So the point in here is, oh no, I don't want to, so I don't want to center it on, sorry about that. I want to center it on the sun. Okay, now when I zoom in, actually I zoom in into objects that are closer from the sun. Anyway, the point being in here, these are the, the main components of the solar system. Now, if I zoom in, this is Jupiter actually right now, and this is where the sun is. So this is the center of the solar system. There are more stuff that pops up that I couldn't see from far away, okay? Between Jupiter and actually uh, Mars. You see Mars in here? Mars in here, not, not near Mars. Mars and Jupiter. There are a lot of other objects in here and they have these names in here. Hebe, Vesta, Ceres, and Orcus is not here, okay? It's actually, uh, again, you have to really pan out to see that Orcus is not part of this picture in here, okay? Because when you look at it again in here, you might think, oh, Orcus is passing through the sun, actually, no. Anyway, the point being in here is that we have so many objects in the iris in here in this case, as opposed to Eris. Uh, this is our object that belong to a belt that is enclosed between the uh, paths of Jupiter and Mars. Okay, between Mars and Jupiter, there is the asteroid belt. And the asteroid belt has some big objects that uh, gained names. And the two famous ones are, of course, Ceres and Vesta. Ceres actually is an important uh, object. It's actually a dwarf planet, okay? It's at a distance of 2.65 from, uh, from the sun. So it's uh, relatively speaking uh, close by. It's actually slightly further than Mars. Of course, all of these objects are further than Mars. If I look at Mars, it's 1.66 astronomical units. And Ceres, on the other hand, is 2.65. So it's a dwarf planet, and it's an interesting planet. Uh, it's an interesting object. I mean, dwarf planet is still a planet. So, so it's still a... Uh, Dwarf person is still a person, just to give you an analogy. This is basically the object we're talking about. So it's, it's, it's big enough so that its shape is actually a round shape. And it has this feature in here that seems interesting in here on its surface. Uh, one of the impacts that basically uh, dislodged so the inside of this, this planet, basically brought it to the surface. And it stayed with this uh, color. So what happened in this case is under this, this outer layer, of the dwarf planet, apparently there is an ocean, okay, of liquid water. And when the impact happened, this is actually an asteroid, when the impact happened, it took the materials from inside the uh, uh, series to the outside, and basically it froze because the temperature is so cold at that point away from the, the average temperature is negative 105 degrees Celsius, which is ridiculously cold, okay? So, uh, Obviously, liquid water will freeze at that point in that case, so it's solid ice. That's why it's highly reflective. So that's how it gave us an indication about its structure. So it has a lot of water in, underneath of its surface. So this is actually one of the interesting objects. So again, this is one of the components of the solar system. And any of these objects, doesn't matter which, are interesting of their own. And they are actually of extreme importance. And they tell us a lot about the, about the uh, some of this object, like for example, uh, uranium or uranium is basically, uh, you look at the shape in here, they're too small actually to have spherical shape, okay? In other words, gravity is not high enough to, uh, to reshape them into a big circle. 
Again, those are just part of the structure of the solar system. Here is the Earth, which is a nice object in the Earth, probably the best objects in the solar system, if not the, it is by far the best object. You have Venus and then you have uh, this uh, Mercury. Now, the point I wanted to drive in here again, if you look far away to the solar system, all the planets, they are forming in the same plane. That's one of the features of the solar system. Furthermore, one of its also main components are this belt between the, uh, the asteroid belts, which usually are rocky materials, as opposed to another belt actually that exists immediately past Neptune. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of objects on the outside uh, outskirts of Neptune, and they have different shapes. They are a little bit not that spherical to begin with, and at that point, it's still kind of flat surface. It still more or less follows the, uh, the ecliptic plane, but it actually uh, starts to deviate a little bit more of it. And the objects in here are more mainly icy structures and like, for example, the stuff that is inside the asteroid belt. And this belt in here is called the Kuiper belt. This is actually where Pluto and all of the other dwarf, dwarf planets, when I say Pluto, there is another dwarf planet in here, Eris, okay? Eris, and like Iris, which is a different uh, 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 object and actually inside the uh, asteroid belt, Eris is actually, and actually we talked about it in here in this unit, is the reason why Pluto lost its status. There were uh, uh, two basically objects that were discovered in the same time, leading to problems with this. At that point, of course, uh, 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 Pluto was still considered another planet, but then when we discovered this, several other objects, including this one in here, Eris, this is the one that threw everything else completely off of, uh, that demoted basically uh, the planet uh, Pluto from being a planet to a just a dwarf planet, because there are so many of them. So the issue that astronomers were facing, should we keep the status of uh, Pluto as a planet? If we do, at least Eris must be another planet because it's similar, similar in size, slightly smaller in physical size than, uh, than, uh, than Pluto, but it's more massive. It has more stuff in it, okay? So now the, the debate raged on and then at this head, because now we're discovering other things. We're discovering, like I said, Maki Maki, Orcus, and all of the other objects, and the list, and Haumea, and all of these objects basically now put everything completely, this is just to give you an idea how Maki Maki is envisioned to look like, okay? How Mia, because it spins so fast on its axis, this actually shape is not, is not a uh, spherical shape anymore. It's actually, it has a, uh, uh, if I can find it, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm looking for it manually, okay? So I could do the search probably, since Coar. Okay, never mind. But its shape, and actually, it's one of the things that we'll be studying later on. It's actually here. It is. I see it now. Its shape is a little bit elongated, okay, because of its extreme fast spin. And then uh, one of the other objects in here, of course, we have Sedna. Sedna is uh, right now. It's about eighty astronomical units. But it can get as far as about 486 astronomical units. I mean, uh, so it's really, really, really far from the uh, from the uh, from the sun. Okay, and it's probably it's right now. It's around the closest of its time when it can get from the sun. 80 astronomical units. It's close, and it's very far from uh, from Jupiter. If you want to make a comparison, this is its path. If I can get, can I get this thing in here? This is. Its path, what is it? Did I lose it? Yes, I did. Here is it. Right now you see, I, can, I can't even find its path because I have to zoom out further to really see its path in here. So at some point it's gonna be very far away. At this scale in here, I'm ridiculously far away from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the sun. But just to give you an idea, at that point, we are well outside of the Kuiper belt and we are in another region of the solar system called the Oort cloud. That is also part of the components of the solar system, which is the Oort cloud. 
and the Oort cloud is not really on the same plane or not even close. It's completely basically surrounding the entire system. And that is made out of the lighter objects that were ejected basically from when the sun basically is started to become active. So these are the different components of the solar system that we know of at least as, uh, as far as today. Again, the biggest player is the sun by far. And then uh, you have the inner planets, the four inner planets, namely uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, I mean, uh, Earth and Mars. I'm listing them in terms of their proximity from the sun. The inner planets, they're mainly rocky. They're mainly uh, hotter. They're mainly, uh, of course, uh, uh, smaller. And they don't have moons in general, with the exception of Earth that happen to have moon. And that moon is an exception that needs some explanation. That's why we have to dedicate a whole unit just for the moon of the Earth, because first of all, to help us understand how moons in general work, and then also to try to understand where this thing came from. And then uh, for the case of Mer uh, Mars also has two moons, uh, Phoebus and Deimos, and both of them uh, they are actually captured asteroids because they are too tiny, and one of them is actually in collision course path with the with the with the planet, and plus it's going to collide very far in the future, probably way before it collides. It's going to be a uh, uh, decimated along with Mars with the Sun when it goes into its uh, hyper uh, stage, basically uh, cycle when it consumes the Earth and Venus and all of the other inner planets. Uh, so this is basically the exceptions. Then we have the outer planets. The outer planets, they're made uh, into two, basically they're made out of gas and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, ice. There is a line, a hypothetical line that exists between Mars and Jupiter where ice or water cannot exist in liquid form. Basically it has to be in uh, 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 a solid form, basically ice. Water cannot be liquid, it has to be ice. You're saying, okay, wait a minute, hold on. Didn't we hear, and we're gonna cover that down the road, that some of these outer moons, like for example, Europa, and even Callisto and all of the other moons, they have oceans of water in, their, in them. Well, those are protected by a thick layer of ice. So yes, for example, in the case of Europa, it has a huge, big structure of, of liquid water that we know exists, and actually salty water. Okay, and uh, but it's not exposed. If that water is exposed, it's going to freeze because the temperature is so cold at those 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 far reaches. Furthermore, it's heated from inside the the, the, the moon Europa, and that heat is coming actually because of its interactions, because of the moon's interactions with Jupiter first, and the other three moons, namely Io and uh, Ganymede, and also Callisto. So that is basically part of the structure of the solar system. And uh, uh, that line, that hypothetical line that exists between Jupiter and Mars is the frost line. That is the line where water below it, which can exist in liquid form, like the case, for example, of the Earth. On Earth, we have all the three phases of water. Water can exist in a liquid form, namely the oceans. This is open space. You don't really have to have it in like Europa contained inside the core of the near the, I mean, inside the planet, inside the moon in that situation. We have our liquid water. We also have ice in the caps in the North and South Pole and also on mountains and also in cold weather. I mean, in the Midwest, it snows a lot. And that is actually here at the Mount San Bernardino Mountains, actually it snows on them. And we have the solid water basically, namely uh, ice. And then we also have water in the form of gas, namely vapor. A lot of the vapor is exists in the atmosphere. Yes, the atmosphere is mainly nitrogen and oxygen, but actually has also water in it as one of its components in the form of gas. I mean, when you're cooking in your, in your, uh, in your, your home, the water that you're cooking, the soup basically starts to evaporate and water basically goes into the atmosphere. So that's actually another thing also is the clouds. The clouds are actually water that is, in the form of gas that is floating on the on the earth. So all of these three phases can exist on the earth, potentially also on Mars, but Mars surface is too cold nowadays that to support that. And the pressure is so low that there is no liquid water on its surface. Um, Venus also, its location could potentially ha have water, but again, because of its extreme hot conditions, it doesn't have liquid water on its surface. 
And the same thing with actually uh, uh, mercury. Mercury is too close where water actually uh, exists. If it does, it's going to evaporate. But in some of the shaded areas of, uh, of in the crater, basically of, uh, of, uh, of uh, mercury, there are indications that uh, uh, solid water exists in the form of ice. So yes, it exists in this location. And like that, when you go to the outer planets, past the frost line, past Ceres, basically where Ceres is, then you have objects that do, that water cannot exist in a liquid form. So this is part of the characteristics of the, of the solar system that we have to address when we're talking about it. So the constitution, all of how it's made and so on and so forth. So let me share with you, unit 34 again, share, I can find it. It is. So this is the stuff I was talking about in here, but let me go back to the beginning first. So again, this is the stuff I know I just did. Uh, we went through the entire stuff with the with the uh, with the software. Let me close it because sometimes it's. Yeah, I want to quit exit. Because uh, I mean, if you happen to have a good computer with a good video card, this is a good software to have, and that is the uh, Universe Sandbox. I mean, it's not free, but it's not expensive either. It's about twenty something dollars. Anyway, uh, so this is basically some of the things that we have in here that we described earlier, and that's a uh, software, and then uh, the rotation of the planets and so on and so forth. Again, this is an overview. By far, as I was saying in the beginning, the biggest player in the solar system is the sun. The sun is the main component of the solar system, followed by Jupiter. Jupiter is, this is basically uh, 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 the sizes, the relative sizes of these objects in here. Okay, then you have the other uh, three planets. I know uh, in terms of physical size, especially if you include the rings of Saturn, uh, Saturn has a big physical size, okay? But I'm talking about the sheer mass and even the radius in this case for uh, Jupiter is about uh, 70,000 kilometers, okay? As opposed to the sun, which is about 10 times bigger, about 700,000 kilometers. So it's just to give you a scale. And the earth on the other hand is just about the radius of it is about 6,400. So the Earth is about 11 times smaller in radius than Jupiter. And since when you have to find the volume, you have to multiply the radius by the radius by the radius three times. So the moon, uh, the Jupiter, I'm sorry, is about, uh, is about uh, actually a thousand times bigger in size than, uh, than the Earth. Jupiter is a thousand times bigger. And the sun is about a thousand times bigger than, than Jupiter. And therefore, the Earth is about a million times smaller than the Sun, just to give you a scale of how things are. Okay, the Earth is 6,400 kilometers in uh, in uh, radius. Jupiter is about 70,000 kilometers in radius, and the Sun is about 700,000 kilometers in radius. Okay, and those are the the stuff that we are familiar with, or at least some of the three indicators in the solar system. Uh, uh, this. Three planets, they're smaller, but they're big compared to the inner planets, compared to the other planets. In addition to that, I mentioned the asteroid belt that exists between Mars and Jupiter. And uh, I also mentioned the dwarf planets. Here are a few of them. Uh, Eris and Pluto are big, but the others are also relatively big, especially Maki Maki and uh, Sedna and all of the other objects. Ceres, on the other hand, is the only basically uh, object that we always mention uh, as a dwarf planet, but it doesn't exist in the same place where Pluto, Eris, and Maki Maki, and Sedna, and all of the others exist. It is actually inside the asteroid belt. This is very close. It's about 2.65 from uh, the sun compared to how the Earth is. It's smaller than Pluto and Eris, but it's still a dwarf planet nonetheless, and I mentioned its characteristics and it's, it's, it's basically uh, properties. Uh, in addition to the asteroid belt, then there is a Kuiper belt where this object Pluto is and Maki Maki and all of the others. And then you have further away stuff. In addition to that, you have comets. Comets, they come either from 
the uh, Kuiper belt from the same region where Ceres and all of this are, and those are usually short-lived stuff. I mean, they don't have long periods. I mean, especially if they come from the inner uh, uh, inner region, which is the asteroid belt. They, they have very short period and they should have died a long time ago because each time they run through the sun, the sun, they heat up and they start to basically uh, lose that, uh, that ice in the form of a tail that forms on the comet. So comets that have a short period, they don't have, they don't live long enough to be seen today. Because again, I mentioned in the beginning that the solar system is about 4.5 billion years old. So those ones, the short-lived ones, must have exist, uh, must have died a long time ago, ran out of materials a long time ago. Now, what about the, the object that we see today? Then there was the hypothesis of the uh, Oort cloud by Oort himself to explain those things. Okay? And that is, there must be objects far, far away coming to the sun and then leave that, okay? And those objects are the ones that have long periods of uh, time. And they still show as comets because they would not have moved enough times around the sun to basically lose all of their gas, basically, to evaporate in a sense and become non-existent. So again, in addition to the Kuiper belt, there is the Oort cloud, which is the outer skirts of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the solar system. So again, I mentioned the Kuiper belt. Any object that exists past Neptune is labeled as a TNO, trans-Neptunian object. I mean, in the simulation I showed earlier, it shows this, this stuff in here. First of all, between Mars and Jupiter, this is what the asteroid belt is. Past Neptune, I mean, past Neptune, yes, there is the Kuiper belt. And both of them, they are more or less on the same plane. They are all on the same plane. So we really need to understand where this thing came from. So this is our, some of the, uh, the stuff that is general characteristics of the solar system. Again, the issue of Pluto's air classifications when it was discovered in 1920, first of all, it was thought to be a, a ninth planet. And not only that, it was overestimated to be bigger than the Earth. It turns out to be smaller, actually. And then because of uh, uh, objects that were discovered in the uh, trans neptunian objects, especially Eris, that is larger than Pluto, then in this case, Pluto has to be uh, demoted. And then the concept of a uh, of a dwarf planet was introduced. In other words, they are big enough to be circular in shape, more or less. So they're spherical in shape, I should say. And uh, they are not too big to be uh, like, for example, the big planets where they actually have a clear path and they clear everything and they're in the same ecliptic plane and so on and so forth. They're relatively small in a sense, okay? But they're interesting objects on their own. Okay, so that you understand. I mean, they have their own moons, and like, for example, the inner planets that don't typically have moons. Uh, 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 Pluto, for example, has five moons, not just one, five moons. Sharon is the famous one, which is a big one, but they still have four more that was, uh, were discovered recently. Okay, I mentioned the Oort cloud. Try right now in the picture that you see in there, at that point in here, well inside, that is actually in the path of Neptune the orbit of Neptune. We're looking at distances of 100,000 astronomical units. This is ridiculous distances. I mean, they are extremely far away. This is what we call the Oort cloud, okay? The Kuiper belt extends uh, up to about 50 astronomical units, okay? But then you have objects that come from very far away. Uh, comets that come from extremely far away, they have their eccentricity extremely high, okay? Very close from one, not exactly one, but very close from one, okay? So in other words, their or orbit are highly, highly eccentric in the sense that they are forming that very, very uh, elongated shape. This is how the hypothesis of the Oort cloud was made, actually by Oort himself. And then later on, starts objects start to show up in it. So it's indeed a validated uh, uh, hypothesis. Okay. Again, most of the planets, and I know we did, when we showed you the simulation, it shows all of these planets basically up to Neptune and all of the inner planets and their stuff that is with them, including the, uh, the asteroid belt, they're on the same plane. That is the ecliptic plane. And uh, far away objects now, like for example, Eris and Maki Maki Haumea and Pluto, they're a little bit off of the uh, of that ecliptic plane. OK, 
okay? So when we come to Unit 35, we really have to have an understanding of what, why that is so. We have to understand why planets do exhibit this, uh, this property, okay? We really have to understand where that is coming from. Again, they are orbit on the same plane, except that there is a problem in here. They are not all necessarily pointing in the same direction. So now the sun, for example, spins counterclockwise with a tilt itself. So the sun itself is tilted by about seven degrees, okay? Mercury has no tilt, namely, if this is the plane of the planet underneath, so it's pointing straight up. So it's spinning right there and there. So it has no seasons. So on Mercury, it has absolutely no seasons. Remember, the seasons are due to the tilt, okay? Venus has a tilt that is basically upside down. So if this is Venus, it's almost like this, okay? So it's pointing in the opposite direction by 177 degrees. I mean, it's almost 180 degrees. 180 degrees is when you're upside down, okay? So it's spinning backward. So in a sense that its rotation is not actually going from uh, uh, counterclockwise, but it's actually clockwise. That's why on Venus, the sun arises in the west and sets in the east, as opposed to Earth, where the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So this is some of the uh, general properties of how the tilt plays a role in here, okay? Again, because it's almost 180 degrees, it has hardly any the, the, the seasons whatsoever, at least due to its rotation. I mean, there are other phenomena involved with the planet. It has extremely hot temperatures. It has extreme high density. It has extreme, extreme I mean, we're going to talk about that. We're going to dedicate a whole unit to it, and then we're going to talk more in detail about it. Earth has about a 23.5 degrees tilt. Mars is not too far. It's about 25.2 degrees tilt. So Mars also experiences similar seasons, actually a little bit more extreme seasons than the Earth, okay? Its winters are typically colder than what they should have been if Mars was only 23.5 degrees tilt. And its summers are hotter than what it should be if it was 23 and a half degrees. Now, you have to understand that the proximity also plays a role. And the fact that it doesn't have an atmosphere plays even a bigger role in terms of its surface temperature. Mars in general is a lot colder than Earth. And in the summer, it can get as hot as probably 20 degrees Celsius, which is comfortable temperature here on Earth. But in winter, it can get extremely cold, OK? And that is uh, uh, something that you have to remember. Besides, Mars takes about two years to go around the sun. So it's, it's, it's seasons. It's basically uh, spring and fall and uh, winter and summer are double of what they are on Earth. So summer is not three months, but rather it's six months, OK? So it takes longer, OK? So that is Mars. Ceres, the dwarf planet that exists between Mars and Jupiter has hardly any inclination. So is actually Jupiter too. But then Saturn also has a, a, a big inclination, 26 points. It's almost similar to that of the Earth. In other words, at some point, you can see the, uh, the rings. And at some other points, when Mars, when, when it's actually going through its seasons, you will not see the, the rings because they're extremely thin. And if you look at them at the right angle, right direction, you will not see them because they're extremely thin compared to the size of the planet. So that's the experiences that tilt, and that tilt is actually because, again, it's moving around the sun, and at some point it's giving us a different face. face. And uh, we will see, basically, uh, that the tilt is, is going in that direction. I'm going to skip Uranus for a moment. I'm going to come back to it. Neptune has a similar 28.3 uh, degree uh, tilt. So Neptune, Saturn, Mars, and Earth, they have similar, more or less, tilt. Okay. The exceptions are Mercury and Jupiter has have hardly any tilt whatsoever, and then Venus is flipped upside down. Okay. And so is actually Uranus. Uranus is actually has a major problem because it's tilted upside down. Actually, as a matter of fact, if all of them they are spinning in the same direction and also spinning more or less in the same direction, including <laughs> a Venus that's spinning on its head. Uh, but it's still spinning on the same, uh, same plane, albeit uh, clockwise, and, li and like everybody else, it is counterclockwise. 
uh, Venus is actually, I mean, Uranus is actually upside down completely. It's, it's completely not on spinning on its head, it's spinning on its side. So it's going like this while it's spinning around the sun. And that is a problem because at some time, the North Pole will be completely facing the sun and will be summer. And at some other time, it's in the opposite direction. It's actually the South Pole that is facing the sun and it's actually summer in that. So the region that is more or less regulated is a transition between North Pole and the equators, basically, where it has a little bit of uh, 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 the seasons don't change much on it, but the others, they go through extreme seasons. So that is Uranus for you guys. Uranus is actually going upside down uh, on its side, as I said, but not only Uranus that is doing that. That means all of its moons are actually on the same direction too. So whatever happened to Venus happened, I mean, to Uranus happened early on to cause it to flip on its side because its moons also are in the same direction. So it's not a later event that happened and flipped it, and then the moons were are going on its equator somehow, and now the uh, the uh, they formed and then they're going on its equator. They're att attracted by it, but the planet is on its side. No, the entire thing is backward, including its rings. It has rings, by the way. All of these four objects they have rings: Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Recently, there was a picture by the James Webb that was published for Jupiter in the infrared re region and because those rings of Jupiter they're extremely thin and also very few you cannot see them in the visible light as good so uh, uh, the Hubble telescope did not get provide those details but the James Webb because they, uh, they emit heat it was able to detect them and actually the picture is beautiful and it looks uh, it looks doesn't look much different than uh, Saturn actually so they all have rings and the rings of Uranus are actually upside down just like the planet is which brings us back to unit 35, because all of these guys, they are in the same direction, more or less. So that should provide an indication of the solar system formed. Now you're telling me, oh, what happened to Uranus and Venus? Those are the exceptions. So whatever happened to them is an exception, not the rule, okay? So Venus probably entered in an early on collision with another object, and that collision probably tilted it completely upside down. Uranus entered also in a collision with another object that probably flipped it just enough so that it goes in its side. Other than that, the others, and they all were in collisions with the one or the other objects here and there. And that caused their tilt, but not big enough. So basically it happened a little later on where they were big enough to basically sustain that hit. Jupiter is big enough, so that did not probably get that, that tilt. And this probably is with the interaction with basically newly formed objects. So again, there are models, and usually you do numerical simulation and try to understand what's going on in here, trying to understand what's happening in this situation, okay? Again, this is something of extreme importance. Knowing the density of an object will tell you what is made up of. If you know the density of iron, for example, which is about eight times the density of water, then that gives you an idea of uh, how, how much dense the material is, okay? So if it's more than one kilogram per liter, that is water, so it's denser than water. If it's less than one kilogram per liter, then it has li lighter stuff in it. So you can tell the constitution just by knowing the density. So how could I find the, the, the volume of an object? Okay, if I know the distance, for example, from here to, the, uh, to, uh, to the Jupiter, which I can find different means of uh, measuring, if I can find that distance from the Earth to Jupiter, uh, then if I find the angular size, remember from the previous unit, the angular size, how big the object is, relatively speaking, if I can find this angle, then it's just a matter of formula in this case to find the diameter of that object. Remember, L over uh, 2 pi times the distance is equal to the angular size divided by 360 degrees. If we use that, then we have found the diameter. Divide the diameter by two if you want to, you find the radius. This is a formula from geometry that gives me the volume of an object. So if I know the radius of a sphere, I can find this volume, four times pi divided by three, which is four times 3.14 divided by three, which is roughly four point something. So it's just a number, okay? Times by the cube of the, uh, of the radius. 
the cube of the radius, yes. So in other words, if I know the radius of an object, then I know its volume. So that's one thing. The other thing I need, the mass. For the case of Jupiter, if I find one of the moons of Jupiter, and if I can track it time in, time out, and it can find its distance, and it's not hard to find the distance, honestly, when you look at the moon, for example, Io, all you have to do is how big it is, how big is this distance compared to Jupiter itself? How many Jupiters I have to put in order to get from the center of Jupiter to uh, the moon itself? That's exactly what they're gonna, are going to do in Astronomy 125 for the lab on how to determine the mass of Jupiter. Because once you know the distance to a moon like Io, for example, that's what the lab is going to focus on is actually, we will have access to a real telescope, a 40 centimeter telescope that will track the position of Io time in, time out, and will give us how long it takes for Io to go once around Jupiter, and also will estimate its distance using the size of Jupiter as a standard. And since we know the size of Jupiter, we can find the distance from between Io and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Jupiter. Once we find the distance, we use this formula. This is coming from mechanics, okay? This is coming from Newton's laws. All we have to do in this case is in order to find the mass is take four and multiply it by pi squared. Remember pi is just a number, 3.19, 3.14 squared, okay? Which is about 10. When you square 3.14, you're gonna get about 10. So we have about 14 here times the cube of this distance, remember, I just said that we can estimate that distance. So we should be able to find that distance. Once we find that distance, in terms of how big Jupiter is, and since we can find how big Jupiter is, is this method. So technically we should be able to find the distance of Io to the moon. Then we're gonna divide it by G. G is just a number, okay? G is just a constant, which is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. It's just a number, okay? It's a constant. Mr. Newton needed it so that his formula works for the falling apple on the earth, okay? And then, times the square of, uh, of uh, the period, namely how long it takes for Io to go once around Jupiter. So we're gonna do this experiment. We're gonna monitor uh, uh, Io going around Jupiter after several periods, we're gonna find after several times, we're gonna find the average time and that is P, how long it takes for Io to go once around uh, Jupiter. Now, if I have all of these measurements and I can do all of these measurements, as I was saying, we can find D, using the size of Jupiter. We can find the size of Jupiter, you're finding the angular size and the distance to Jupiter. We can find the time it takes for it to go once. This number is fixed, G is just fixed number, it doesn't change. Then we can find the mass of Jupiter. The lab name for astronomy 125 is called uh, uh, finding the mass of Jupiter really using this method. Once we find the mass of Jupiter and we just measure this volume, then we can find the density. It turns out the density of Jupiter is slightly bigger than that of water. So if I know that, then I exclude a lot of the heavy material materials like iron and nickel being the main constituents of this planet. So basically I have a good idea of what makes up this planet that mainly gas and other ice objects that are a lot less denser. So that's basically what the idea behind the density is. The, 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 Density in this book, they use the Greek letter rho. So this is the Greek letter rho, which is just a density. I mean, you could use the letter D and it's no big deal, okay? So again, these are all of the things I was talking about in here and how to find the density. And the density has an immediate consequence and that is the con what makes up that object, okay? An object that has a density of about five and that includes Mercury, Venus, Earth, I mean, Venus is slightly less than five. Mars is even less than that, about three point something. The moon is about three point something. So that indicates for the case of the moon that the, 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 the core is a lot less than the actual planet, okay? For the case of the Earth and Venus, and more so actually for Mercury, the core must be big and it has to have a huge mass in this case made out of a uh, higher density, uh, more dense materials to justify the fact that you have five kilograms per liter. Granted that the surface of the earth is the mantle in general is made up of silicate and silicate density is a lot less than five, but the core itself is actually far more than five. So on average it's going to give you five. 
as opposed to the outer planets that have densities actually, in the case of Jupiter, slightly more than one kilogram per uh, liter. And in the case of Saturn is actually less than one kilogram per liter. These two are almost two kilograms per liter. So that indicates that they are made up of uh, liquid basically because water's density is exactly one kilogram per liter which brings me to an important point in this case because saturn's density is less than one kilogram per liter and water is one kilogram per liter if you take the planet saturn and if there is a big enough ocean to put it in and you put it in that ocean it's not going to sink it's going to actually float it's going to stay on the surface why because it has tremendous density i mean sorry the opposite has the least dense planet in the solar system. It's not going to float. Whereas all of the others, including Jupiter, which has slightly more than one kilogram per liter, it's going to actually uh, sink, okay, because it's a little heavier. So this is, in a nutshell, what this unit is, okay? And this is basically the, the composition of the different objects based on the density and the density alone, okay? Still have about 10 minutes, maybe we can talk about the next unit because I'm hoping to cover some more materials by uh, uh, Wednesday when we meet, especially in terms of the homework. Okay. So basically, uh, I don't know if we're going to do it justice, honestly, if we do that. Okay. So we're going to learn in unit 35, and it's immediately connected to unit 34 in terms of the, the consequences of what, what these things are coming from. Because again, remember those properties of the solar system, how everything is on the same plane with the exception of the lighter stuff in there. So that should give me an indication how the solar system formed. The first thing in here, the first question to ask is, when was the solar system formed? That's the key question. So the method that is used in here is radioactive materials. Okay, so what is that? Every material in nature has the property that it will decay. I mean, most of the materials, I should say, the vast majority of them, they have radio radioactive properties, okay? Some of them are highly stable, like for example, lead, okay? So what happened in this case, you start with an amount of material, let's say, for example, one kilogram, just for simplicity's case, okay? You start, start with one kilogram. And obviously, a given atom is not predicted when it's going to go radioactive. It could go radioactive now, or it could go radioactive after a month, or it could go radioactive after a year. There is no, it's not an exact time when it's going to go radioactive. But the entire bulk, remember, one kilogram of matter has a huge number of atoms. It has about Avogadro number, which is 10 to the power 23 atoms. So on average, all of them, they will give you a number. After a certain time, half of the uh, original mass, which is we said we started with, uh, with a thousand uh, grams, which is a uh, one kilogram, after a certain time, only we would be left with 500 grams of the original material. So what happened to the other 500 grams? Well, it changed. It went to a different form. Okay. So that's basically what, what uh, radioactive decay is. We call that time what half of the material is gone, the half life. And that is a characteristic of that material that doesn't change. So the half life is unique to every single element. Okay. Some of them are within minutes, and some of them actually within a fraction of a second. And some of them they take billions of years to decay. Okay. Now, obviously, the ones that decay rapidly are useless for this type of studies because if I have one kilogram, and let's say, for example, it takes a minute to, live, to lose half of it, and the next minute I will lose another half of the half that I have left, so I'll be left only with 250 grams. Three minutes later, I will be left with 125 grams. Three minutes later, one minute later, so four minutes after that, is going to be down to what? About 100, uh, about 60. 68 or 64 or something like that. And the number starts to shrink, okay? In about an hour, I will be have nothing. I will have basically negligible amount so that I really don't have anything. And if you're not sure, just wait another three days and you have nothing, okay? The point being in here is I need to have uh, uh, materials with half-life that is of the billions of years. Then this is the plan. 
I can look at this material, potassium, for example, that has potassium in it. Potassium has a half-life that is in the billions of years. I know the daughter, we call a parent, and a daughter, the parent is what is the original, and the daughter is basically what the element that is formed off of it, okay? So in this case, potassium, we start with 100,000, and then after half-life, we lose uh, 100,000 to about 50,000, half of it is left. And the other half splits unevenly, not evenly, unevenly between calcium and argon. So in this case, calcium and argon are what is known as daughters. What is apparent in this case is potassium. If I with another half life, half of the potassium also would be gone. So 25,000 uh, 25, would transform into calcium and argon in the same proportions as the original number. Okay. At any given point, the numbers add up to the original amount, 100,000. And now in another half-life, again, half of this is gone, and then the others will increase according to the same proportions, and so on and so forth. So if I have today a sample of potassium that has these proportions in here, I ask, how old is the sample? Well, it's easy. It's one half-life, two half-lives, three half-lives. So all I have to know now is what is the half-life of, uh, of potassium, that's all. So this is, in a sense, how we use uh, 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 dating, basically using uh, radioactivity to find how old objects are, okay? To use, to know how old objects are. That's the method we use, okay? Now, this is again for long-lived objects. For example, we use that also, for example, in, uh, in uh, Geology also, we use it also to determine the, how old rocks are and things like that. But it's also used in archaeology also, but that is because the time scales are a lot less than billions of years. We cannot use potassium because potassium will ha hardly change in a period of, let's say, for example, 10,000 years. So in this case, I need another element. And carbon in this case is a good candidate for that. And that is the essence of uh, radioactive dating using carbon, carbon dating, okay? Carbon dating uses carbon instead because you have uh, carbon-14 is, 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 uh, is a prime product of how nitrogen actually in the atmosphere is transformed, nitrogen-14 is transformed to carbon, and uh, plants transform carbon. I mean, transform nitrogen, I'm sorry. They consume nitrogen part of their, it's actually a nutrient for the plants. It's an essential nutrient for the plant. So plants, they have, I'm sorry, uh, carbon, carbon, what am I talking about? Carbon, yes, and nitrogen too, but carbon is the essential element in this case. So carbon 14, which is coming in this ratio. So as long as the plant is living, it's going to take carbon in the same proportions between carbon, normal carbon, which is carbon 12 and carbon 14. After the plant dies, then in that case, there is no more intake of carbon-14 or carbon-12 of that plant. The plant doesn't consume anymore. But the carbon-14 that you have in the plant will start to change automatically due to the same phenomenon into carbon-12. So now, if I have a sample, if I have a, 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 a plant or a piece of wood, that if I can determine its content of carbon-14 versus how much carbon is, I can tell how long this thing has lived, as long as it's only within thousands of years, because that's roughly how big the, how, uh, the half-life of carbon-14 is. So it's useful technique. It's not just for plants, actually, it's for animals that feed on plants and animals that feed on animals that uh, feed on plants. Okay, so <laughs> as long as this whole cycle exists when uh, animals are living, so this thing is no big deal and it can really can, uh, 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 can basically uh, can uh, can have basically determine the age of these things. Again, I'm going to stop in here. I know I don't really want to start it, and then in the middle of the idea, we will really lose sight of where we are. So I'm going to stop it in here, and I'm going to see you guys on Wednesday. Wednesday, I promise is we're going to finish Unit 35 because it's essential. We have to do that. That's part of this exam in the term. And then we're also going to do some uh, uh, problems from homework 13 and talk about homework 13, homework three, so that we're going to, uh, to uh, discuss that and make sure that you guys have full understanding of that. Sounds good? Yeah, sounds good.
Okay, very good. So don't forget, we have a review that is going to be available this Wednesday for the exam for the midterm. That is by far the most important thing that you guys need to do this weekend. You still have other stuff that is due. Please take care of that things that you had from before and things that you will have in the future. Thank you.